before, but let's pray together. Jesus, thank you for your word. I thank you uh, for all that you've been teaching us here in the book of Ruth, and I pray that you would open our eyes today to the very things that we need uh, to learn and to grow. And, and the example that Ruth and Naomi and Boaz and, and just the work you're doing behind the scenes in so many ways, I pray that it would meet us in a very personal way where we're at in life right now. And so I thank you for what you're going to do through your word in Jesus' name, amen. Well, kind of as one thing I, I do is, is we're looking to go through a book in, in this particular uh, case, Ruth, is kind of look at a theme that kind of runs through this whole book. And I really, and, and what stood out to me is that there's a sense of hope throughout this whole book. And there's just these little traces of hope and God pulling us into hope. That's why every week we started with a hope in something. And so the first week we, we talked about how there's hope in suffering and that, that often gets missed, right? But when we go through suffering, we kind of get to the end of ourselves and we finally get, God has our attention. And, and there is a sense of when God gets our attention, bringing us to a sense of hope. He doesn't leave us hanging in the suffering. He's like, there's a way out and I want to show you it. And that's what he basically does uh, with Naomi. And then last week when we looked at um, the idea of, of just how God's providential hand in leading us and guiding our lives and getting us to where we need to be. Uh, he has a way of doing that and he knows exactly where we need to be even when we don't know where we're going. <laughs> and we're kind of walking around going, I, I just, you know, there is no luck, there's no chance, there's God's providential hand. And I hope you really got that this week. And so I want to remind you as we talk about today's uh, area of hope, that biblical hope is way different than, uh, than just the worldly hope. And I know I mentioned this already, but I just want to bring this home because if you think it's just worldly hope, then you're wishful thinking. That's all you're doing is, is, is hoping on a wish and a prayer, really, right? And so it's more than that, though. It's anchored in who God is and what he says he is and in his promises. And I think the psalmist in, in Psalm 33 says it beautifully. He says, we wait and hope for the Lord, for he is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May May your unfailing love, Lord, be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. And we have hope in God. Why? Because he's our help, right? We're, we're trusting in him and we trust in his holy name that he's capable of, of getting us to what we need or where we need to go. And why? Because we've learned about his unfailing love. I mean, just think about this for a moment, especially those of you who have received salvation, okay? God, is, is his love conditional? It's not, right? He full out loves you with an unfailing love that just should blow our minds. Like it's not conditional based on how we perform. When we're just flat out messing up, God's love is not less on us. It's full out just as strong. And when you begin to think about that, then you have to begin to know that even when you're in your lowest spots, God hasn't withdrawn his love. It's there just as strong. And so I encourage you to meditate on those verses in Psalm 33 and just let them kind of get into your mind and your heart and your spirit. If you're feeling like God is, is not there and your hope is wearing thin, let God restore that hope. So today we're, we're actually going to go into talking about how uh, when, we, when we actually get to a spot of hope and petition. And now petition is not a word we use very often today. But it is a word that means basically we ask, okay? So we petition God for things. We ask him for things. Uh, a petition, you know, basically the biggest probably realm of petition that uh, is probably the most scariest, especially if you're a guy, you've probably you know, you've been here or someday you might be here, is when you ask somebody to marry you, <laughs> right? Like, like there's a, a, a fearful moment because you're hoping they will say yes, but you don't know if they'll say yes. And, and you're, you're in that type of, of, of spot of just kind of hoping, right? And, and then there's this risk involved. And so you are, you're going to ask. And, and one of the biggest things about that is, is, is you're, you're just hoping that, 
the answer is going to be positive. Now, I don't think anybody proposes and thinks that the person they're proposing to is not going to say yes. But you know, when you, when you see those jumbotrons at the game, when someone proposes to somebody and she like runs away <laughs> and you're like, oh, poor guy, right? <laughs> you know, he should have known not to do that. And, uh, and probably another one is, is when somebody has to say, well, I've got to think about this for a while. <laughs> and, and they don't give you a yes right away. That's not a good sign either. And yet, when the proposal ends in yes, right, there's a credible celebration. And you go tell all your friends and everything. Now, I want to tell you about how I proposed to Carrie. <laughs> uh, listen, Pastor Lou was actually part of that. Uh, we were actually, uh, at the time, meeting at Lockport High School. And I showed up one Sunday in a suit and I um, found this picture that was one of those billboards or just kind of those uh, bulletin boards. It has a snowman on there and Carrie loves snowmen. And so I, I made up a sign and it said, will you marry me? And Pastor Lou took that picture of me standing in my suit next to a snowman uh, saying, will you marry me? And what I did was I, I turned that into a puzzle and Carrie loved putting together puzzles. And I took a, the, the puzzle pieces that made up the sign were about six pieces. So I took those pieces out and I just gave her the box of the puzzle. And on the day before Easter, um, I proposed to her. And so I gave her that puzzle. I took the other six pieces and I hid them in uh, those plastic Easter eggs and I hid them around her condo. And some of them had candy in it and some of them had puzzle pieces and she had to go on search. So she puts together the puzzle. There's six pieces missing. She's going on this search for all the eggs, looking for the pieces. She gets them, puts them back, and sees the sign. Now listen, when she's doing that, we're on the, we're on the floor, and I'm already on both knees. <laughs> and she looks at me after she puts it, and she's like, what does that mean? <laughs> I'm like, what does it mean? Like, I'm like, all of a sudden, everything just, just went. And, and fortunately, listen, I didn't have the ring out yet. So when I pulled the ring out and she saw that, she said, yes, and, and it was all good. Uh, but, but it was, and to be fair, I realized afterwards, I never had a question mark on it. it. Just said, will you marry me? And it didn't have a question mark. I left the punctuation off. And if you know Carrie, she's really keen on punctuation too. And so anyways, that's how I proposed to her. And, you know, it was a wonderful time. Now, now, here's the point. Whenever you ask, there is great risk involved, right? Because, again, you don't know the answer until you actually ask the question. And once you finally hear the yes or no, that's what, that's what you're anticipating. But that's what makes asking so hard. Today we're going to see this play out. We're actually going to see it play out in a proposal story between Boaz and Ruth in chapter three, and it's another wedding proposal, and, and it's, it's filled with a lot of anticipation and stuff, and next week we're gonna get into, uh, there is a wedding coming up, and it's gonna be great. So listen, as we get into this chapter, what, what I hope you've seen is, is here is Naomi's and Ruth's temporary needs. They're being met. Why? Because they came back to Bethlehem during the harvest season, right? So they're able to glean in the barley harvest and their temporary needs are, are being supplied. But listen, the barley harvest is coming to an end. And, and this is where we're at in chapter three. Like there's only a harvest season for so long and then the harvest ends. And so basically I told you when that first day of harvesting, she got about 10 days worth, but you know, every day she goes out, there's only a little bit and it's not like she's got months uh, stocked up. And so they're thankful for their needs being met today, but there's always this in the back of your head worry, what about tomorrow? Listen, I did landscape work for a long time uh, in my life, and one of the things is, is during the summer, the good months, you know, I was working overtime, I was making a lot of money, and everything was good, but I always knew that there were three months that I wasn't going to work at all. And no matter how hard I tried to plan for those three months, those three months were, got very scarce by the end of them. And it was very much uh, a struggle at those times, and those were still those tough months. So... Naomi realizes, like, there's tough months coming up ahead. And so she begins to plan, 
We've got to do something. We've got to make something work so that there's a long-term solution. And she already has seen that Ruth has found favor with Boaz. And remember from Boaz last week, Boaz is a close relative. He's what's known as a kinsman redeemer. And so we read this in Ruth 3, verse 1 through 2. It says, One day Naomi said to Ruth, My daughter, it's time that I found a permanent home for you so that you will, not, so that you will be provided for. Boaz is a close relative of ours. And he's been very kind to you by letting you gather grain uh, with his young women. Tonight will be win- tonight he will be winnowing barley at the threshing floor. And so basically, what you see is Naomi. She steps into the role of matchmaker. She's like, I'm going to hook my daughter-in-law up, <laughs> and she she begins finding a way of trying to make this happen. And I know it seems a little strange to us some of these cultural things that are going on, but I think they're really important. And it, and, and when you understand what God's design was, you kind of start to get it. But God had a really high value on the family unit. And American culture doesn't. Let's just be honest. We don't. So, so a lot of this gets lost because we don't value the family unit as much. But God and the Israelites took the family unit very seriously. And connected with that was the, the family their inheritance, the land that came with it, that they lived on. I mean, they, were, they took that very seriously. And if a family had no heirs, like there were no children, there was no son, the land would be bought and taken over by someone else. And so in many ways, what would happen when that took place was the name of your family was basically erased. You, you ceased to exist and, and really to have made a mark in Israel. And so God built in this idea of the kinsman redeemer where a close relative could step in and marry a widow and then their first child would carry on the name of the original family and maintain the inheritance of that land. And so Naomi's plan was to get Ruth hooked up with Boaz. And to do that, uh, she had some very specific instructions for her to follow. Look at what it goes on to say in verse 3 through 4. Wash, put on perfume, and get dressed in your best clothes, and then go down to the threshing floor. But don't let him know you are there until he has finished eating and drinking. And when he lies down, note the place to where he is lying, and then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. Now, again, last week, We talked about God's providential hand, how it leads our lives to help us get to where we need to be, but but we also know that that didn't mean that we don't have a part in it, a stake in it. Ruth went to work, right? So that's why she met uh, Boaz, ends up in her field, and, and all of this is happening and her needs are taken care of because she did something. There's always a part that you and I play in God's plan, okay? Whatever God wants to do in our lives, God wants us to participate in. And so, you know, I I find it interesting that some people, like, they pray for, like, a Christian spouse someday, and and then they go home every night, and they sit there and watch TV. (laughs) Now, listen, God could do a miracle, and somebody could actually show up on your front door and knock, 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 I'm here, (laughs) but it's probably not going to happen, right? And so probably one of the better things that you should do if you really want to meet a Christian is find out where there's Christian people that are hanging out and go hang out with them. And then God can probably do something in that. And so I I just want us to understand like there's God's part, there's our part, and some of us just sit and wait for God to do it all. And it's not going to happen. Proverbs 19, 21 says, Many are the plans in a person's heart, but it's the Lord's purpose that prevails. So we're to make plans the whole time while watching for where God is moving and letting his purposes prevail in our lives. And that allows us to really have this sense of hope and rest in God and what he's doing, but we don't sit and do nothing, okay? So the great plan that Naomi comes up with for Ruth is to take a bath, put on some perfume and put her best clothes on and get ready to meet Boaz. And I know it sounds like she's getting ready for a date, right? But that's not what actually is going on here. And it's really important for you to see that. You see, the story of Ruth, how did it start out? The story of Ruth started out with Ruth losing her husband, right? And it's shortly after she loses her husband that she journeys back to Bethlehem with Naomi. And they come into Bethlehem, and for now the last six weeks or so, four to six weeks, they've been working this harvest, now, listen, there, there may have been about a six-month period that's gone by from the time she lost her husband to where she's at right now. But listen, she's a new widow, okay? 
And in that culture, widows would wear a certain type of clothing that indicated that they're, they're a widow and that they're mourning their death of their husband. And so you would be able to tell by what somebody was wearing in their culture that they were a widow in mourning. So taking a bath and putting on new clothes would indicate that she's no longer mourning her husband and she's actually being open to being married again. I mean, that, this is really an important part of the story. So she is then to meet Boaz at the threshing floor. That's because Boaz has been working there all day. He's pulling in the harvest. He's, he's um, really guarding that harvest overnight because remember, this is a day and age when Everyone did what they felt was right. So there's a lot of evil and wickedness coming in. People are trying to steal your grain. And so here he is trying to protect that. And think about that. He's been working all day. He doesn't have a bath. He doesn't smell too good, probably. And so there he is. But the reason Ruth is told to, to do this, she's, she's told to go in and to hide out and watch until he falls asleep. She is to, to uncover his feet. That kind of sounds a little creepy, right? Somebody's hiding around the corner watching you until you fall asleep and then they uncover your feet. But the reason is, is, is that women really were not allowed to propose to men. And so the, the only cultural thing that was allowed is for them to lay at the feet of a man and if he would realize your intentions, then he would realize and maybe you, you could, he would say, okay, I want to marry you. That was kind of a way to indicate it. On the other hand, so, so this is what, what she does. She lays at his feet so that Boaz, and, and she's told, her mother-in-law says what? Wait until he tells you what to do. That doesn't make sense unless you realize that cultural concept. He's, she's waiting for him to, to instruct her on what he's going to do. But on the other hand, though, I think I want you to think about this. Ruth could have come to Boaz not in a humble position, but demanding his protection under the law. You're a kinsman redeemer. You have to redeem our family. You have to do your duty. But she doesn't do that. She comes in humility and in servanthood. And we talked about that last week too, right? This is something that is part of Ruth's character where she doesn't demand her way. She, she just humbly opens herself up to receive whatever blessings God has. That should always be our approach to God, humility and as his servant. We come to him as humble servants of God. But before we move on and talk about the next part, I want you to be very clear that you understand there's actually nothing sexual going on here. Um, in this story, there's nothing that Ruth is doing to try to seduce Boaz into making an improper uh, proper moves on him to, to really get with him that night. That's not going on, okay? And you, you could see that again if you know all these cultural things that are going on. So let me say that. With, with all of that, Naomi's instructions still brought great risk to Ruth. I mean, what if somebody saw Ruth heading to the threshing floor as the sun's going down, what are they going to think? And it was common, actually, in that day that at the threshing floor, prostitutes would hang out to, to try to get something with a guy. And, and it was a perfect plot, spot for them. And, and remember, Ruth is not an Israelite. She's a foreigner. And so there, there's a risk there. There was also a risk in that she's dressed up and has perfume on. I mean, think about this. Again, think about the day and age and that everyone's doing what's right. There was a real chance that as she's headed there that somebody might have raped her. It was risky because what if Boaz misinterprets Ruth, what she's there for, her intentions, and thinks that she is trying to seduce him? It was risky because if he misinterprets that, he then could start looking at her more different, right? Right now she has his favor, but she could fall out of that favor. And it was also risky because he could simply say, no way, I'm not going to do this. And so even though God seems to be leading this way through Naomi to get Ruth to do this, he didn't eliminate any risk. Our hope in what God is doing doesn't eliminate risk. It should help us take those risks. When we feel like God is in the middle of this, then I'm willing to step out and take a risk, even though I don't know how it's going to land, right? As long as I know God is leading, I'm going to take those risks. And, and that's something that I think many of us need to really understand and do. When God is leading you, step out and take the risk. He's not going to take all the risks away. 
There's always going to be risks. And so Ruth takes those risks. She follows her mother-in-law's instruction. And we read this in verse 6 through 7. So she went down to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law told her to do. When Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he went over to lie down at the far end of the grain pile. And Ruth approached quietly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. Now listen, when it says that Boaz finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, some people read that and it's like, well, he got a little drunk. <laughs> and it's, again, not saying that at all. Let me show you why. Let me show you a couple of good reasons why that can't be the case. Again, first of all, remember why Boaz is there in the first place on the threshing hold floor, sleeping there at night on a stone ground to protect his harvest. He doesn't want anybody to come in and rob him. So, you know, if you're, if you're drinking a little too much, you're not going to be on your toes ready to fend off somebody who's coming in to rob you. Second, as the night goes on, we're going to see that he acts in a sound mind. He acts with wisdom. He acts with, he makes good decisions, right? Which none of those are connected with drinking. <laughs> you, you don't make good decisions when you're drinking too much. It just goes out the window. And so, furthermore, the context of being in good spirits is connected to really what God has commanded Israel to do when they're in the harvest time. It's supposed to be a time of celebration. There's a feast. There's a celebration going on. In fact, Isaiah 9, 3 says, they, will, they rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest. Like, there's a sense, a connection to joy in the harvest time. And so Boaz, again, is a godly man, and so it makes sense. He's in good spirits. Why? He's thankful, and he's rejoicing because all of that God has provided for him. Like, he is, he's at the end of the harvest. He's seeing all of God's blessing, and he is filled with a sense of joy. Let me just ask you a question. On payday, are you in good spirits and rejoicing and thanking God for his provision for your life? I mean, if not, I, I say try it this week. Get that paycheck and start doing a dance and thanking God for all that he's given you and provided for you because he has. And the point is, is Boaz isn't drunk. And I think that's also important because what Naomi is saying is not look for an opportune time, again, to take advantage of Boaz. She's not saying that at all. And so courageously, Ruth follows the instruction. She approaches Boaz. He's sleeping after an exhausting day of work, and so he's out. And she uncovers his feet and quietly lies down next to them. I want you to think about this. Can you imagine what's going through her mind as she's laying at his feet, just waiting for him to wake up? It doesn't say he wakes, it says he wakes up around the middle of the night. We read this in verse 8 through 9. In the middle of the night, something startled the man. He turned and there was a woman lying at his feet and he said, who are you? And she said, I am your servant Ruth. Spread the corner of your garment over me since you are guardian redeemer of our family. Listen, a couple hours may not sound like a lot of time, but it is a long time when you're anticipating something. So you know this, like if you're going on vacation tomorrow and you, you, you know you're going to get six hours of sleep, you, you spend five of those hours anticipating having to get up. <laughs> and you can't fall asleep, right? There's, there's just something about anticipation and counting down makes the night seem to last forever. And so here is Ruth lying at Boaz's feet thinking, will he marry me? Will he redeem me? Will he step into this role? If she was like me, she's probably thinking, maybe I should tickle his feet and wake him up sooner. <laughs> and get his little attention, right? But how often does that feel like that to you? Like, you're, you're sitting there waiting, God, when are you going to wake up? When are you going to step in? And when are you going to finally take me out of the midst of this trial and suffering that I've been going through? And God seems asleep or at least oblivious, but he isn't. Just like there's a moment when Boaz wakes up there will always come a time when God acts and that God steps in and, and, and hears your petition and responds. And, but listen, I understand that night watch can feel like forever, right? As you're waiting and waiting and waiting for God to come through. Now put yourself in, in Boaz's shoes. You're sleeping, you're, you're flat out sleeping like a rock and all of a sudden you wake up and you just know somebody's in the room, right? Remember, he's sleeping to what? Guard his harvest. So he's probably 
in this moment thinking he's about to get robbed and his heart races and he's in fight mode. Like, I, I'm going to take somebody out. And so he asks, who's there? And then he hears a woman's voice and she says, it's your servant, Ruth. I just want you to think about this. In a, few, a few seconds ago, you were sleeping. You wake up, you think somebody's ready to rob you. Your emotions are all over the place and then you're relieved to hear a woman's voice and that it's Ruth, it's a person you know. And then she makes her request. She said, spread the corner of your garment over me. Now again, sounds a little strange to us. And what does it mean? It's, it's actually, again, the same phrase that Boaz used to her in Ruth chapter two, verse 12, where he said this to her. She, he says, may the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. He was speaking a blessing over her life that she would come under the wings of God's protection. And here, Ruth is requesting May those wings also be your wings. In essence, he's reminding Boaz of his own words, a prayer of blessing over her life. And she's basically saying, will you become the answer to your prayers? You prayed this, now will you do it? She's straight up asking him to marry her. Listen, I'll tell you what, praying for others is a good thing. And sometimes the things we pray for, we are like, God, would you, would you just kind of meet somebody and, and be there? And, and so we pray for God to do something. We pray for others to come into their lives. And then sometimes God moves and says, you do it. <laughs> and you're like, that wasn't the plan when I was praying. I was praying for you to do something or for somebody else to do something. I wasn't praying for me to do it. And yet, oftentimes, I found God do that to me. Okay, you now are part of the answer to the very prayer you've been praying. And so there's a, let me just give a little bit of background. There's a few reasons why Boaz would never have approached Ruth to ask her to marry him. It's not like he's just an oblivious guy who's not uh, interested. But listen, we already pointed out she's a new widow. And she's been wearing those clothes, right? So Boaz knows she's in mourning. We also know that she's a foreigner from Moab, and she was also now kind of working for him in a way in his field. So now he's like, you add all of that up, and there's all of these reasons why she's not even an option for him to pursue. On top of that, she's much younger than he is. But listen, Ruth's proposal changes everything. Now, all of a sudden, what he thought was impossible becomes, well, maybe this will work. And so Boaz's response shows us that he had actually thought about Ruth, but never thought it could happen. He says this in verse 10, the Lord bless you, my daughter. He replied, this kindness is greater than that which you have showed earlier. You have not run after younger men, whether rich or poor. Boaz is moved by your second kindness. And the first kindness was what? He saw her leave her family and just commit herself to Naomi. Her second kindness is now she's willing to walk away from all of these younger, more attractive men and still choose Boaz in spite of it all. And that's a big deal because, listen, Ruth did not have to do this. She was free to marry anyone she wanted to. But if she did, what would happen to Naomi? Naomi. Naomi, her family would lose that land. All of, no one would carry on that family name. And all of that would transpire. And so, as you look at the life of Ruth, I'm awestruck by her unselfish love. Her commitment to put other people first and to love them beyond her own uh, self. And that's what true love does. And truthfully, we don't see this very much today. We see people loving themselves first, and if it's convenient, maybe I'll love that person over there. But here's the deal. Scripturally speaking, we're never called to love ourselves first. Mark 12, 30, verse, or 12, verse 30 through 31 says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There's no commandment greater than these. So we're called to what? Love God first. Called the love God for us. Getting that right sets the stage for us and our ability to 
love anybody around us. And then we're called to love our neighbor as ourselves. That word as means equal. And so the way you love yourself is how you're supposed to love others. But that doesn't come until you love God first. And so Ruth doesn't live her life based on what she wants. She strives to live for what will please God and those she loves. That's why she's not running after younger men. That's why she's open to being married to Boaz. And this blows Boaz away when he realizes this. Boaz knew right away that there was somebody else that had first dibs on Ruth, though. And he knew that he had to go through that person first. But because Ruth had again proposed to Boaz, it forced the issue. So he now plans to go to this guy to see if he will fulfill his duty. And so he says this in verse 11 through 12, and now my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all you ask. All the people of my town know that you are a woman of noble character. And although it is true that I am a guardian redeemer of your family, there is another who is more closely related than I. And he points out, Something incredible here. He points out that she's known as what? A noble woman. This is the same Hebrew phrase that we find in Proverbs 31.10. It says, a wife of noble character, who can find? They're rare. They're out there, but they're rare. But she is worth far more than rubies. This is the type of woman that Ruth is. She's worth far more than rubies. Boaz definitely has this desire to marry Ruth. But he is uncertain whether this nearest kinsman would step up first and desire her as well. So Boaz, think about this. He seeks to do God's will and God's ways for God's glory. He doesn't try to cut corners. Some of us, we, we see God's blessings. It's within reach. And what do we do? We're willing to compromise. We're willing to cut corners so we can get there faster And so we can make sure it doesn't slip away from our hands. Boaz isn't doing that. He's saying, okay, God, if it's your will for me and Ruth to be together, you're going to work this out. There's a guy in the way, but you're going to move that guy. And I'm going to trust you in that. Listen, don't mess it up, what God wants to do by cutting corners. Trust in the providence of God that he is going to lead you to his blessing at the right time in the right place. He knows how to get you there, and he delivers it on time. So we read this in verse 13 through 14. Stay for the night, and in the morning, if he wants to do his duty as your guardian redeemer, good, let him redeem you. But if he's not willing, as surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. Lie here until morning. So she lay at his feet until morning, but got up before anyone could be recognized, and he said, no, no. No one must know that a woman came to the, flesh, uh, the threshing floor. Again, there's nothing going on here that's inappropriate. She's laying at his feet all night, but he is, he's having her spend the night because there's a couple things he's doing. He's wanting to, again, protect her. Why? If he, she goes out in the night, she's in danger of somebody coming up upon her. So he's protecting her from physical harm, but he's also protecting her reputation. Nothing went on. But somebody could think something went on and then damage her reputation because it appeared bad because she was at the threshing floor at night. But early in the morning, he does send Ruth home with a blessing. Look at what it says in verse 16 through 17. When Ruth came to her mother-in-law, Naomi asked, how did it go, my daughter? And then she told her everything Boaz had done for her and added, he gave me these six measures of barley saying, don't go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. That's huge. There's, there's sometimes these little statements. Don't, let your, your mother, don't go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. Remember what Naomi said when she returned to Bethlehem? We read this in 1 verse 21. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. And her emptiness was real. But God is clearly giving her a sense of hope. It says, things are turning around. And I'm going to start filling you back up, Naomi. 
And so there is a sense of hope as this chapter comes to a close. Now listen, as we close this chapter, it ends up leaving us on a cliffhanger that we'll have to get to next week. The proposal ends in a maybe, (laughs) exactly where we don't want it to be, right? But it ends in a maybe due to circumstances that are outside of their hands and their control. And so Naomi says this in this last verse to Ruth. Then Naomi said, wait, my daughter, until you find out what happens. For the man will not rest until the matter is settled today. And that word wait literally means just sit down. In other words, we might say sit tight, right? Sit tight and just wait and see. And sometimes the most godly thing you and I can do is sit tight and wait on God. Listen, waiting on the Lord is never wasted time, but it can be one of the hardest things you and I do. Up to this point, Ruth's acted She's done her part. She followed godly advice, she, all, all the advice she could have. But now there's nothing more to do but see what happens. And that may be where you're at today. You've done everything you know you possibly can do. You follow God and his plans as much as you know how to do as well. And if that's the case, Naomi's advice is still good for us. It's time to simply sit back and wait on the Lord and let him do what he's going to do. And while that can be really hard to do, I want to point us to some scriptures that teach us what we're to be doing in this time of waiting. Psalm 130, verse 5 through 6 says this, I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits, and in his word I put my hope. I wait for the Lord more than the watchman wait for the morning, more than the watchman wait for the morning. Notice that while we're waiting, what are we doing? We're putting our hope in his word. We're watching for God to move and answer. There's a sense of hope and anticipation in God this whole time that we're waiting. It's not just waiting and doing nothing. It's waiting in anticipation and hope in God. It's, it's filling your mind with his word and trusting in what he has said. And sometimes that's all we can do is we, we got to get our minds back on what's right and, on, and filling ourselves with that hope. The second verse is this, Psalm 4610. I already referenced it this morning, but it says, be still and know that I am God. Be still. Listen, when was the last time you just shut up and you just thought about who God is? Like, took it all in. Be still and know I'm God. Not your problems, your problem's not God. The obstacle you're trying to get over is not your God. He's God. He's bigger than it all. Sometimes we don't have that space where we reorient our lives. Third verse is Exodus 14, 14. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. And I think there is just a time that we have to just know that ultimately my battle is the Lord's battle. He, and he fights for me. <laughs> So sometimes he just wants us to sit back and watch what he does. Okay, you've done all you can up to this point. You can't do any more. So sit back. Get in a lounge chair, sit back, watch watch what he does. Watch him come through. Watch the miracle take place. And here's what I know. When, When suffering is long and hard, our hopes have been dashed, it's so easy to begin to think we don't have a good God. But if you're there, then the only thing I can tell you to do is you've got to stop and soak up God. So your suffering in this place has become greater than than the God you serve. And the only way out that I know of is get in his word. Begin to replace what I see as the, the circumstances are being greater than God with who God is and that he's greater than my circumstances. The only thing I know is to let God become bigger as I spend time in prayer, just meditating on who he is, letting him speak to me for who he is and wait on the Lord 
and just begin to wait in anticipation, watching what he's going to do. And I just want to encourage you today, if you're at the spot where the answer is not there yet, and you've asked, and you've done all you can do to begin to wait in expectation and, and hoping in his word, and go over those three verses again. Begin meditating on them. Look at other verses, but just soak up what God says he is and what he's going to do and let him fight for you. Would you bow your heads? Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for your word. God, I know even as we go through this story and, and we see all the ups and downs in Ruth and Naomi's life and, and there's a sense of hope each step of the way that still leads us just hanging on going, I'm still hoping it's not answered yet. I've seen good things coming, but I still don't see the problem solved. God, many of us are there. We've gotten those glimpses of hope that gives us just enough to get to the next day, but we're really waiting for you to solve the problem. And Lord, we've done all that we can do, and I just pray there's a sense of encouragement today to sit back and now wait on you, God, and watch in anticipation what you're about to do. God, may we know that you are a good God, even when we've questioned it. May we begin to see, God, that you are bigger than anything we're facing. God, I pray that Lord, we would understand that any battle we face is yours. And that means that victory is it's, it's not up in the air. It's already secured. And as we sang today that song, I'm going to see a victory, God. I pray, Lord Jesus, that that would just infuse a sense of hope in our hearts and lives today as we're anticipating and waiting for a victory in our lives. And so we thank you for the power of your spirit to speak deeply into our hearts and souls, to give us a sense of hope and to show us what to be doing as we're waiting for the final answer to come through, God. May you encourage people today, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.